program. What would you do if you had the microphone to inspire people? I think about this season that we're in, the season of peace and the season of love. I think of Christmas. Christianity is the religion of peace. Christianity is the true religion of peace. Islam is not a religion of peace. Christianity is the religion of peace. Christianity is the religion of peace. The religion of peace. Turn the other cheek. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. These are messages that come from Christianity. What can you do? What can you do in an age of deceit and lies and terror? What you can do is reaffirm your own religion. Instead of letting your church become a mosque or a, a, a Unitarian uh, a meeting place or a drunk tank on uh, Tuesday nights, you can go to church again. However hokey that sounds, however cynical you are, however hard you are, however unneeding you think you really are, you know in your heart that there's something missing in you. You know that you crave something greater. Because the human being is not a dog. The human being is not a bear. The human being is not a fly. The human being is not an eagle. We are unique creatures. And we need something different than the bear, the dog, the snake, and the eagle. What is that thing that we need? It's that thing called God. These creatures, they don't know God. They are of God. They were created by God. But they don't really need God. That's why they're lower animals. We, as higher animals, need higher things than just food and fornication. Unfortunately, our society, primarily because of the degenerates in the media, have fallen lower than the snake. The media has promulgated the idea and promoted the idea that we only need f food and fornication. And so when people are empty, that's what they seek, food and fornication. And when they're really empty, what happens? They become drug addicts. They start with marijuana. They end up with heroin, crack, you name it. What is it about drugs? What is it that human beings are seeking in drugs? Why do they go for drugs? As God has been driven out of America, drugs have entered America. I know this has been said before. I get it. But what does an empty soul look to do? An empty soul looks to fill itself. Just as an empty vessel needs to be filled with a liquid to be complete, an empty human being needs to fill itself to be complete. And how does it fill itself? I know, again, many of you will laugh because you're cynical. That's through those things I'm talking about, inspiration. The musician finds the inspiration God knows where and then has the inspiration to pick up the, the, the instrument. Do you think a musician can play one day without inspiration from somewhere, unfortunately, so many musicians don't have that human inspiration that they seek, and they get it th through drugs. I get that. I understand. It's true for many artists who don't understand that the greatest artists were not drug addicts. The greatest dr artists in the history of the world were not drug addicts. They were usually God addicts. Did you know that? Look at the greatest art in history. You'll find most of them were super religious people who literally saw God in their living room. And they took the power of God, and it was transmitted through the paintbrush or through that piece of marble. How could a man like Rodin take a piece of inert stone and inside that stone see the essence of a human form and sculpt from that block of inert stone of marble the portrait of a human being that looks so real that a uh, hundred years later I go and look at them in the museum and literally inside that carved eye, I can see the person. How is that possible? How? My voice and my ability to move crowds is my gift, but it's also my burden. This is a power, the magical voice. It's a power I first discovered when I found out I could speak to the assembly in the first graded PS48 in a slum school in the Bronx. I found out that I enjoyed speaking to that crowd of kids. I wasn't afraid of them. I loved seeing their faces smile when I told a joke or made a, f a fool of myself. It didn't matter. I was a little clown, and they laughed. I liked that. Or well, when I spoke with such a clear voice and wasn't afraid, the little pipsqueak that I was, and the crowd listened to me, I enjoyed that power. And I discovered something. 
I discovered I can move audiences, and that means I can change people's fates. As I learn later in life, it's not about just being a clown. It's not about entertaining people and making them laugh. It's about changing people's fates. It's a great gift and a great burden. I must tell you, I see as my last day in radio, my last day on earth. Would you believe that? I know you don't believe that. I know it's a, it's a form of reverse worship. But it's the only way to approach what I do and have any meaning. If I look at every show as though it's my last show, I look at my, my every book as my last book. That's a pretty big stress, by the way. But it also permits me to be fresh and new. I said again, and I'll repeat it again, some inspire through hate. Do I have to say who? Do I have to mention who inspires through hate and division? Do I have to say the names or the organizations that use hate and division as their stock and trade? Or through anger, rage, false righteous indignation? I've used all of them. In my 21 years, i used every one of those emotions to move my audiences because every one of those emotions raged through me or played through me, or danced through me. There's a story of Einstein. I love this story. Great, great physicist Einstein. Uh, at this point, he was quite famous, and he had, he had agreed to an audience with some man, I don't know who it was, was allowed to see him. The man came in, Einstein was sitting behind his desk, and he said, Herr Einstein, Herr Einstein, I realize what your theory of relativity means. It means that nothing is real. Nothing is real. So as the story goes, Einstein stood up slowly, walked over to him and slapped him in the face. And he said, is that real? Now, you see what I'm saying to you. Don't get so disconnected from reality with your philosophy that you forget the danger you put yourself in, whether it means slipping on a sidewalk because your head is in the clouds or bicycling through an intersection and killing a civilian because you think you're so great, as occurs too often in San Francisco where there are no laws against these bicycle terrorists. Or, in fact, in many other ways, you can get so disconnected from your body that you have no reality. Which leads us back again to how do I inspire you in an age where those who hate us want to kill us, and in fact are killing us. I'll be right back. Savage. Of a white Christmas. Is it a little too soft for all of you savages and savagettes out there? I hope not, but sometimes you got to go in a different direction. And I'm talking about inspiration to the savage nation and how to inspire without using what the left uses, which is hate and division, without using anger, rage, false righteous indignation, which the left uses on a daily basis. You say, where do I get inspiration from? I told you my father was a small businessman, owned a little small antique store, in New York's Manhattan, and some of the stuff in there at that time was really good. I recognized it for what it was. I always had an eye for the good stuff. I could tell the difference between Dore bronze and, and let's say, pot metal, for example. I learned how to do that. Different type of metals, different type of clocks. He taught me to look at the hands of a piece of sculpture. He said, always look at the hands and the feet. You'll see whether they're good or bad. He taught me to look at paintings in the same way. Many artists can paint bodies they can paint faces they can't paint hands and feet he was right he was right about a lot of things so i learned at the hands of an, uh, an intuitive smart man with regard to things that are good and things that are not good the point is the workmanship the point is is that things are preserved through generations that are beautiful whether it be a pair of dueling pistols or an antique statue or a painting you look at the great art in Europe. What in the world does that not do for you when you go to Europe and go to Italy and see the great art in the churches, by the way? And here in America, in the churches, in the universities. And what are the illegitimate doing on these campuses today? The illegitimate who never belonged there in the first place are now screaming, rip down the art because it's racist art. I swear to God, there's a lawsuit right now from some illegitimate piece of... Ter I can't even use the word. He wants all of the art in the museums in America to re be removed because it offends him as a non-white person that all depictions of Jesus are of a white man. This is how sick the country has become, that we would let such gutter rats rise to such high places, and I blame the lawyers, I don't blame the rat. In other words, if you have a legal system that is so flawed that it permits this kind of lawsuit, you know in America anyone can sue anyone for anything, why is that? 
Why? Because the lawyers wrote the laws, not because the people want that law. But anyway, that's a separate point. I'm saying inspiration. So I get some of my inspiration by buying guns or clocks or paintings, small things that show me that people can preserve th things through war, revolution, hurricane, tornado, fires. Somehow they're preserved. People preserve what they can. Savage. I had no idea there were so many heroes in the cafeterias. All that tomato soup, and, and when I was a kid in, in, in the Bronx, I hated tomato, the smell of tomato soup. When I went in the cafeteria, I would retch from it. That smell of institutional soup. See, my day, they actually cooked the food. It wasn't brought in in like a, like a, a, a tray from McDonald's or wherever they bring it in from. Marriott food catering. In my day, they had like weird looking women. I mean, they were like out of like mental institutions. Working. Remember they looked. They looked like those dietitian. They didn't call dietitians. They worked in like the school kitchens. They were scary women. They were very pasty. They all looked like that. They were like devil worshippers to me. I never wanted to touch any of their food, whatever they made. But that smell of the tomato soup, as I entered the cafeteria, what the PS forty nine in the Bronx, I think whatever I went to, I go to the cafeteria like instant smacko migraine the minute I walked into the. Ugh, that smell of the tomato soup. I mean, if you're repainting your car, okay, you take a quart home, spill it on the hood, wipe it in, and like, you know, it's miracle wipe, takes the paint right off. <laughs> I don't know what they put in there. It must have been like, gov you know, excess government tomatoes from Italy or something after the war, that they bought tomatoes from the Italian, who knows, they bought them underground tomatoes. They don't have them anymore, right? Now they're like basically from San Quentin. This new crop, these, this new crop isn't even like wacky. I mean, they give ex-cons jobs. I don't believe they got to have a job. Look, nothing wrong with that. But they're all voters. Motor voters, you know. They're motor voters. So here we are. That smell of the chicken. I can still smell it. There was another smell that got me sick as a child. I'm thinking of like I'm doing my Proustian olfactory now. Uh, there's another smell from childhood that comes back. It's like Campbell's chicken noodle soup. It's like a mixed feeling. One homey, friendly. Uh, the other side, like MSG-ish, no good. Not equal to my mother's soup, which always gave me a migraine. And any soup that didn't give me a migraine, I didn't trust. Courtesy of Buddy Hackett. Now, he put it in another way. I was raised on such bad food that I had no idea that food was... I, I didn't know what good food was. If food did not leave me slightly dyspeptic with a migraine, I thought it was a bad meal. <laughs> it was so awful. I mean, it was high cholesterol, high salt. Impossible to believe they could feed a child food like that and not go to prison, you know, for, for child endangerment. I mean, you talk about school. It's no wonder I got a Ph.D. in nutrition. I was like running for my life to try to figure out what had been done to me the previous 25 years. If you took a lab animal, let's say the, the, the arterial system in an animal that's closest to man is a pig or a rabbit, as I understand it. Because I know that uh, Dr. McCulley at Harvard used rabbits in the 1950s. To induce atherosclerosis, he denied them vitamin B6. Uh, he diminished their diets of B6 and almost immediately gave them a hardening of the arteries. You don't know about that. Your doctor doesn't want you to know it. He only wants to put you on Lipitor so you become a cripple and need arthritis drugs after you have to take the Lipitor-related compounds. You start walking around like your uncle, you know, with a killer. So Dr. McCullough used the rabbit. But if you took a rabbit or a pig and you put them, God rest his soul, on the diet I ate as a child, the animal's dead in six months. So it's actually a miracle. I, I mean, I must have some superpowers that I could overcome what I was force-fed. From childhood, foods that my body re rejected. Even milk I hated. I hated milk. You have to have your milk. They put a clown thing on top of the glass of milk. Well, we have other stuff to talk about today. I'm just angry because I went to my... I'm, I'm never going to this Chinese restaurant again. It's not just that you risk your life crossing the street to get to that hellhole. But the guy behind the counter has the ugliest, meanest, most horrendous face I've ever seen in a restaurant. I lost my appetite. You know about fight or flight? This guy is the owner. There's two owners. One is nice and one is nasty. When I say nice, that's, of course, a qualified statement. I mean, he's not nasty, but that doesn't mean he's actually nice. He never smiles either. But this is either the brother or the brother-in-law. I actually hate going there when the brother-in-law is there. Let, you remember the old Chuck Norris movies when they would re liberate Americans from Vietnam, uh, Vietnamese uh, prison camps with the guard towers? Okay, picture this guy in a guard tower with an AK-47 and a 
and a conical hat. Now sit yourself down in a restaurant.